Hello and welcome to this video. This video is for Inverness College UHI built environment students and we are going to be looking at the Hounsfield tensometer test. So the Hounsfield tensometer test is a test that is done to test the tensile strength of some steel samples. Now in the videos that we're going to see and some of the pictures we're going to look at three different samples and we'll look at those in just a minute. The three different samples will have different carbon contents in them and we're going to look at how that affects the overall uh, strength of the piece of steel as well as the ductility of the piece of steel. Now we have a video here that was done previously by one of our technicians uh, and we'll run it through and I'll talk through what is happening. So you can see we have this piece of equipment, it's called the Hound tensometer testing machine uh, and as you can see there is a steel sample that has been placed in between two clips at this location just down here. Now the technician is winding the handle and applying a tensile load. As, you, as the tensile load is being applied the strength of the load is being monitored using this gauge here. We have a piece of graph paper on this drum and it is rotating and as the strength is increased the technician will place a dot on the graph to show the relationship in terms of how much the piece of steel is being stretched and how much load is being applied. And we'll let this video run through just to speed it while longer. So the different piece of steel will take different amounts of strength for it to, to break. Now this test is being done through until uh, the fracture of the piece of steel. And as you can see the strength is uh, continually going up from the mercury in the gauge here and that is being transferred over to the graph paper where the technician is marking it with a dot. Skip it through some more. And what this is doing is forming a nice curve on this piece of graph paper where after the test is completed, we will join those dots up and draw a line of best fit from which we can do some analysis. From So you can see the piece of steel in here, you can't really see it in too much detail, but it's being stretched under the tensile loading. And this screw is being turned and applying the tensile load in the direction towards the handle. Increase the volume as it breaks. You can hear the steel break there. Okay, the technician will then take that sample out and some measurements will be taken of this. We'll just pause that video there. <clears throat> So I'm going to show you some pictures of what steel samples look like and some of the measurements that we will take before and after the experiment has taken place. So as you can see here, we have a standard uh, piece of steel that will be uh, work within the Hounsfield tensometer machine. As you can see here, we've got another piece of measuring equipment. Now this is to measure the elongation of the sample. So before the sample goes into the Hounsfield tensometer test machine, it's set to zero. And you can see the original gauge length, that's the length of the steel sample, is 25.25 millimeters. And this is all done before the tensile test is carried out. What we can see then is our uh, test sample A, 
And this is where the, the sample has been tested and has been joined back together and put back into the elongation measuring gauge. As you can see here, we've got change of length equals elongation percentage of the gauge length. So this works out as percentage of the total length. And as you can see here, this is something that you can note down that we have an elongation of approximately 10, 20, 30, just before 40. So around about 38% of the original length that is elongated by. Similarly for sample D, we can see here it's been joined back in again. This has got a different carbon content, which we'll come to in just a moment. And you can see here the elongation of that sample is 10, 20, around about 25% of the original length. And the final sample that we have is sample N. And again, you can see here it's been joined back together and put back in the gauge. And this elongation looks like it's around about 13%. So we have approximately 38% for sample A in terms of elongation. We have 25% for sample D, and we have 13% for sample N. Okay, now, as you can see, we'll, with this graph is what will be plotted, but I will come back to that in just a moment. This is how the sample is put into the Hounsfield tensometer. We have clamps at either end where it is put into the machine. Tensile load can be applied. You can see here that we have some pins on the rings that will clamp these together and uh, it'll apply the load nice and evenly. That's it in place there, as you can see. A little bit of a zoomed in look at the actual machine itself. You can see here um, the test piece is uh, put in and the two pins will attach it to the Hounsfield tensor machine itself or chucks for a more technical term. Uh, we have the mercury will be zeroed. So we've got mercury in this measuring gauge and it's set to zero at the start of the test. And then we have the graph paper, which revolves around this drum uh, where we will mark the graph on. A few more information there. So we've got a bit of to do with the scale, which we'll see on the graph in just a wee while. Uh, you can see the direction of the travel is away from the mercury as it's stretched. That's the drum that can be taken off and the graph paper installed onto it. And we've got a two ton beam that can apply the loads. Also, some measurements that have to be taken is the reduction in area gauge. OK, so you can see here the original sample size. We'll put that into there and we will set that clamp uh, to zero. Okay, so the original sample size will be set to zero using this clamp here. We can then see, obviously, as we stretch the sample, that it's going to reduce in area near where the fracture point is. So you can see here the test sample A, it has 0.1% of carbon. And you can see here that when we put that back into the reduction in area gauge after the sample has been snapped, it's actually uh, around about 68% of the um, original size. Okay, so you can see as it's stretched, the reduction in area is 68%. Original diameter was 5.05 millimeters and it's reduced by 68%. Then we can look at uh, sample D. So again, uh, that's 0.4% carbon this time. And you can see the reduction in area is slightly less there, at around about 55%. And then finally, sample N, this is 0.8% carbon, and we are looking around about 30% reduction in area of that sample. This video is a little bit more zoomed in on what's happening um, in terms of the gauge for the loading. So we'll press play. And you can see the mercury rising as the load is being applied. You can't see the load being applied on the wheel, but we saw it in the previous video. And the mercury is rising as this goes. And as you can see, the drum is turning round. What we would do is this gauge here would track the thermometer or the, the load as it goes up. And as the load goes up, we will dot the graph paper on the left hand side. Now, 
the mercury will keep rising until it reaches a certain point. And then we tend to see the mercury uh, level off before it falls down just before fracture. So you can see the mercury is still going up at this point as the load is being applied. And we can see the force in um, newtons is on the, on the right hand side there and, and the scale that goes up. So we can see the mercury still rising at this point. And I'll let that play through. It's only a couple of minutes long. And it's reaching somewhere near, probably near its uh, capacity at this point, and it's staying relatively static. And as the steel sample uh, starts to lose its, its strength and it's approaching its yield point, we will see that mercury start to fall. As you can see now, it's starting to fall. And as it approaches the fracture point, it will dramatically fail. As you can see there. Okay, and again, the next video on here is very similar. It's a little bit uh, sped up, so you can see the mercury again rising. It's a little bit clearer on this video. And the tensile load is being applied nice and uniformly. Keep increasing until it reaches its maximum load. Obviously, this would be tracked if we're doing it properly using this gauge here on the left hand side. reach somewhere near its maximum load. It will stay relatively static for a short period of time before we see it starting to fall down once it's gone past its maximum load. It will drop off and then dramatically fail. Excellent. This is the sample sizes at the end. <clears throat> so you can see we've got sample A here, the reduction in area compared to the reduction area in sample size N. So this one had 0.1% carbon, whereas N had 0.8% carbon. You can see the effect uh, of more carbon um, reduces the ductility of the sample size. That's the original sample, as you can see there. We have the original gauge length of 25.25 millimeters, the original gauge diameter of 5.05 millimeters. What we'll do is we'll go back to the graph now. This is the graph that was done to, uh, for the three samples that we have looked at. I'm just gonna pull this up here so we can annotate it a little bit. So as part of the laboratory here, we can fill in some parts of our result sheet. So we have our yield point here. Now the yield point, as you can see on this graph, is this point here. So we have the three different curves. They all start at zero, zero here, zero here, and zero here. It's just as the graph paper is moved along. Now the yield point is at the point where it's just kicking here, 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 and here. Okay, in the example that's shown there, it's extrapolated to the left-hand side, and we can pull off a value in terms of the force of when the steel sample started to yield. Now what we mean by yield is that it has gone past its, its elastic stage. So you can see in this example here, 
if at any point the load is taken off this sample during the elastic stage of that line going up, the sample size will be returned back to its original, original length. Once it's reached its, its yield point, what happens, it then actually goes into the plastic stage where the deformation is permanent. So this is our yield point. So from this graph, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to populate the loads that will go into these three boxes. Okay, the next thing to look at on the graph is what we call the maximum load. Now, this is a maximum load that a piece of steel would take. And as you can see, it is the top of the curve. Okay, so you get here, around about here, and around about here. And again, we can extrapolate that over, as we can see on the sample N example, to a load on the left hand side here. And we can see here that we've got 20 kilonewtons, 10 kilonewtons. So be able to use that graph to work out the maximum load for each of the three samples. And you'll be able to populate the graph just from here. Next thing to have a look at is the fracture point. The fracture point is just here. And this is where the sample has failed and the graph has stopped recording, which is the position just here at the end of the graph. And as you can see there, as you can see there, and as you can see on sample A just down here. And again, we will extrapolate across and we would use the graph to come up with the fracture point loading for each of the three graphs. Here, here, and here. Okay, now the elongation we can get from uh, the elongation gauge, which is from the photographs before. We can also work it out in terms of the change in length in the graph. Now you can see down here we have a magnification factor. Okay, and this graph paper is uh, not our normal size graph paper, and this fact that there's 16 boxes in each one of these and not 10. The fact that we are using magnification size 8 means each one of these boxes is 0.2 millimeters. Okay. So for sample size, for sample n, you can see here the change in length is between that point and that point. So you can count the number of boxes across, and that will give you the total change in length. And um, so count the number of boxes times it by 0.2, and that will give you the change in length. And that will relate back again to the elongation, and it should tie in to the elongation gauge within a couple of percent. So again, you can put in the elongation percentage in each one of these boxes here also. Um, an example for that would be on this sample size D here, I had a look before, and I counted 32 boxes uh, at 0.2 millimeters each, gives, gave me a total change in length of 6.4 millimeters, okay? And that works out at 25% elongation. And if we looked at the photographs from before for sample size for sample D, we can see there that we have 10, 20, 25% is what the elongation gauge was working out as. So I would like to see those calculations as part of your lab report. Reduction in area. That can come from the reduction in area gauge photographs, which we looked at previously. And for this test, we are not doing the hardness. Okay, that will be using a different piece of equipment. So what I would like you to do is look on our virtual learning environments where you will find this graph populated. You will find the laboratory coursework and you can carry out your normal laboratory test as you have been doing on your other materials. That is all for this video. And if you've got any questions, always feel free to contact me. My name is Matt Millward, and I'm a lecturer at Inverness College, UHI. Thank you for listening.